Hi everyone, this is Mike Schwartz. I'm the founder and CEO of Glue, and today I'm going to give you some counterintuitive advice to not use two-factor authentication unless you really need it. Remember this old definition, um, two-factor authentication is two or more of something you have, something you know, something you are. Back in 2003, conventional RIP wisdom held that two-factor authentication was the best bang for your buck in security. And in many ways, this holds true today. Misidentification of a person is the root cause of many of the recent large hacks. Why do we put so much emphasis on intrusion detection and so little emphasis on intrusion prevention? Is it because preventing breaches in the first place would require us to change our behavior, or even more challenging, to change our culture. So while it's true that stronger authentication is required to prevent breaches, it's also true that progress is defined as not having to do something. So how can we both better identify people and advance our quality of life at the same time? So you'd think that with over 200 multi-factor authentication vendors and millions of dollars in venture capital invested that this authentication problem has been solved, right? However, today the focus has shifted, and it's clear that we have no shortage of better ways to authenticate a person, but it, it's about how to implement a multi-factor authentication in a way that has good design and good usability. And the best usability is to not authenticate somebody. To never, never authenticating is, is, that's the best possible usability. It, system should just know who I am. So how do we combine no authentication with multi-factor authentication? And the answer is to only use multi-factor authentication when a transaction warrants it. So trust elevation, when we go from, let's say, a lower form of identification to a higher form of identification, has really been the holy grail um, for quite some time. Internet banking has always been at the forefront of digital person identification. Know your customer is the first rule of banking, but how do you know someone when they show up at your branch as a stream of electrons. So not surprisingly, um, banks are very interested in this topic. Um, for example, um, when you log in with a password and you want to add a wire recipient, your bank may send you a text, text message. Um, that text message is a simple example of trust elevation. It's because the bank wants to be even more sure that it's really you on, uh, on the other side of that website. So in 2011, a group formed at the, the OASIS Standards Organization to try and tackle this problem of trust elevation. Industry heavy hitters participated. For example, the editors of the specification include engineers from uh, Bank of America, Chase, and Safe Biopharma, companies with a vital interest in seeing this problem of trust elevation solved. Um, I really like the definition that they came up with. It's, it's so different from the NIST 863 definition, you know, something you know, something you have, something you are. Forget about something, forget about that stuff. This definition is much more nuanced. It's, we'll never know who this person is, and trust elevation is all about mitigating the risk that it's not this person. So despite all this progress, passwords still rule today. And the reason is simple. The research shows that while some authentication mechanisms are more secure and some are more convenient, no strategy for person identification is more deployable than passwords. If trust elevation is a one-off for each application, it will never scale. Organizations sometimes have dozens or hundreds of applications, so it's essential that policies are centralized or every application would have to implement this very complex business 
logic to support multiple types of authentication. Many of you may remember this design pol um, pattern, policy decision point, policy enforcement point. It was used by some of the early web access management platforms um, in the early 2000s, and, and it's still useful today. As you may know, the latest and greatest way to implement a PDP PEP architecture is called OAuth2. PDP PEP is policy decision point, policy enforcement point. Um, OAuth2 is, is JSON REST friendly. It's RESTful. It may not exactly be REST. Um, it it's may be complex, but anything that's unfamiliar is complex. There's a lot of innovation going on in OAuth2 land. And it's evolving into one of the best tools we have to address the challenge of trust elevation. So in my session um, at RSA, I'll go into more detail. OAuth2 defines a number of players, um, a person who's using a client, like a mobile application or website, to access APIs. And, and the, the thing with the ACI, APIs, the resource server, um, relies on the authorization server. Um, the authorization server is the PDP. Um, that's the basic idea. Different profiles of OAuth2 have evolved to solve different problems. The two that I'll focus on are OpenID Connect and UMA. UMA is the User Managed Access Protocol. I'll also talk about how we can collaborate on trust elevation across organizational boundaries. So this talk is happening on Friday at 10.10, and I hope you can make it. Thanks for listening.